Okay, folks, uh, it's 3.10. I want to be respectful of everybody's timing here, so thank you for showing up. Um, my name's Steve Wally. I'm going to talk about open source software engineering education. Uh, this is really an experiment that's been running for about five years now. And so I want to walk you through my pedagogical learning and all the mistakes I've made and the things that we've learned. Um, the thing you should focus on on this slide is the chicken hat. <laughs> Um, the, the long list of other stuff is, I, I have a long history now, starting back in 1980, of doing engineers collaborating. It started in the standards world with big standards like the POSIX Unix standards uh, through IEEE and ISO, and that kind of cascaded into open source related things. Um, I think about things in a very particular way because back in the 90s, uh, we were implementing the standard we had helped build to build a certified product out of a whole lot of open source before we called it open source. And so that idea that you were taking upstream projects and assembling them into downstream product and engaging in those projects appropriately for what we were trying to do with them is just something that kind, kind of came naturally to the team. Um, we got acquired by Microsoft in 1999. It was an asset acquisition. For those of you that don't know what that means, none of the investors and none of the founders got wealthy. But it was a really interesting ex you know, experience working there for a while. Um, I've since, over this last kind of 10, 15 years, I've done a lot of work in the open source world in the nonprofit space. So uh, I've been on lots of governing boards and lots of directed funds at the Linux Foundation. I have chaired those. I've been the Linux Foundation board member for Microsoft, the Microsoft Eclipse Foundation board member, and I've helped set up working groups, which is the moral equivalent there. Um, and I continue to be involved in entirely too many of these things. I'm not a governance person. I want everybody to understand that. I care about product engineering and open source. The rest of the stuff just comes along. So the problem, where this all came from, is five years ago, um, I was in a grand debate inside of Microsoft. I came back to Microsoft seven years ago. And you know, I've always hated this quote really, really deeply hated it. Um, with all due respect to his wealth, I think he's wrong. And I think he's wrong because you start looking at the Optoverse GitHub report. And remember, this is just GitHub repos. Year on kind of every other year on kind of, and like that, that is actually somewhat exponential in its growth. And so the, the not Mark Andreessen quote um, is, you know, we're actually drowning in software at this point, and most of it is mediocre, duplicative, and bad. Um, the, the, the end of the joke, the horrible punchline of the joke was when I said this five years ago, I then said, and in five to ten years, we'll be drowning in AIs, most of them mediocre, duplicative, and bad, and I didn't want to be that prescient. <laughs> so stepping it kind of back into a real, you know, problem statement, um, there is a startling lack of understanding of what open source means in a production environment. Um, and you step into these spaces and the knowledge of software engineering practice is being diluted in a world where anybody can be a net producer of software in a published kind of format. And so, you know, there's this idea that anybody with a book, a three-week course, a three-month course, a six-month boot camp can be a net producer of software at this point. It means that all of those folks that, I, I've always lived in that software systems engineering space where it's about deploying and then maintaining and sustaining code at scale over a long period. So I, again, I've had to think about the problem differently. Um, and the, the software maintenance problem or the sustainability problem or the security problem, however you want to think about it, you know, this is an accelerating problem. You know, I've, I've been joking for a while now that software transmitted disease is the new, new STD. Um, so the aha moment was to sit down and agree that actually well-run, I always preface the well-run, open source communities are these amazing labs for teaching software engineering experience when you think about it. Like that, that experience that goes into making these releases on a regular cadence, how decisions are made collectively towards the evolution of the software, all the tool chains and the evolution of those tool chains as a community grows. Like these, these are good engineering practices. And what if we created kind of an undergraduate course 
and layered kind of a little bit of open source experience and a little bit of software engineering theory, and then taught intellectual property basics you know, for engineers. I, I, I grew up in, an, in Toronto. And if you went through an engineering program you know, back in the 70s, you, you always had that half, that one semester course that was IP for engineers. Because every engineer had to understand basic trademark, copyright, and patent law. And you know, that, that's just what you did. And I, I look around and I keep hearing software people say, oh, I don't care about copyright. And it's like, I'm sorry, you have to. It's the law. And every creative, every musician, every photographer, every artist understands copyright law. I, and I'm sorry, every programmer needs to understand copyright law as well. So what if we kind of took those basics and then we created student projects with mentors in big, well-run open source projects? And that was the lab and homework component. And that, you know, this, this is how Semesters of Code was born. And you know, we, we had a rich educational history here. There are some fabulous professors that have been trying to figure out how to teach open source for a long time. But the problem I'm trying to tackle is a little bit different. I'm trying to tackle the, the software engineering uh, challenge. And you know, we've had Google Summer of Code. I mean, they, they've 20 years now, they've put through roughly 20,000 students. Like these are good programs. These are rich places of, of experience that precedes. Uh, semesters of code, but it's also places that I could look from and figure out why that wasn't working for what I needed. So let's start with the first experiments. A um, gentleman named Jacob Green and I met. He introduced me to Saeed, who we have the pleasure of in the audience right now, and I stepped into Johns Hopkins four years ago. And the idea was, could we do an undergraduate program? And remember, we're, this is four years ago. We're still living under COVID. Um, Hopkins has an intercession, which is three weeks at the start of January, where it's between the fall and spring sessions, and they run kind of three-week, two-week classes that are free, that are kind of, here's a topic, go learn something. And so we ran a mini one that was basically, you know, choose your own open source adventure, and we kind of came through, and there was some simple kind of theory classes around all of that. There was some simple lab work and you know, getting folks up and running in Docker containers so they had consistent environments across Macs and Windows machines and things. And we felt that was enough of a success. I think we had about 25 students through it. It was generally well rated that we went ahead and we tried a proper fall course that following fall. And so this was, okay, so this is now, I am not a, a professional teacher. I'm now building course curriculum. We're now stepping into the space. I'm lifting mentors and large open source projects into space. And it is this idea of there's kind of this heavy practical aspect to this course as we come into it. Um, we had a couple of prerequisites. We basically were assuming that we had students that knew how to program and knew what a data structure was. That was kind of the, the force on them. A couple of 75 minute lectures a week, and then the big project. Um, sizing the student projects, we were assuming we were willing to take, I think, 35 students, but we, we knew there'd be some flutter in that. Um, I happily got 20. I was excited. But we had a collection of projects. Um, PAS was a university project. It's a publishing system within the university world. Lutes is the content system they use for open govern, uh, government pro uh, projects in the city of Paris. Uh, PowerShell from Microsoft. Semesterly was an interesting student project. And Open Cravat was a cancer research project that there was kind of a rich history there. Um, the second year, we had a couple of repeats, but we also had Anarchs from Red Hat, uh, Patternfly came in from Red Hat, .NET also stepped in to join, uh, and Odyssey is a really big, uh, well-used project for data crunching across the planet. Anarchs not Red Hat by then. No, Anarchs not Red Hat by then, says the man who lifted Anarchs into place. So. Um, and my request on any of these open source projects was you have to give me at least two mentors for resiliency, which was good because in the first time we tried this course, I lost three mentors um, through job changes in the economy that, that fall. And so, okay, so resiliency is important, two mentors for resiliency at least, and each open source project had to give me at least five student projects. And so remember, these are individual student projects. 
Um, we had roughly 14 weeks, so we figured we'd be getting 50 to 70 hours of time out of a student for that lab homework kind of component that would be this open source work. Um, yeah, we, we generated lots of ideas. Is this low-hanging fruit in some of the big open source projects? All the way down to, hey, is this fairly risky? But since it's not about, did you get a pull request in? That's not what they're being marked on. We weren't worried about how much code did you write? How many pull requests did you get? We were really focusing on the experience of working with your mentors in complex code and complex tool chains. Remember, the only software these students have ever seen is like homework. Like none of them have seen software in the real world. Uh, the very first class I ever stood in, I asked her, like, how many people have worked for a software company in their summer internships? And I had one out of the 20. Um, now, I'll be very clear, this was a very aggressive student who had gone from Amazon to Google to Microsoft kind of thing, but like one. The rest of them had just had summer jobs. General evaluation, again, remember, I, I am not a university professor. I am making it up. I figured instead of like I vague, vague memories of my own university days, okay, so the, the project will be the big thing. So I don't want a final exam. So 50% is the project. I was lucky I had the head of undergrad pulled me aside and she said, you must break that mark in two and force the students to earn the first half by the midterm because otherwise they will all push the work to the end of the semester and drown. And she was absolutely right. Um, you know, 20% for two in class, I, 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 I invented tests. Like, and then 10%, that was the fudge factor, you know, class participation. You can, you can hide a myriad of evils in class participation. Um, and, you know, trying to drive discussions around short reading assignments, things like the trusting trust paper that to this day is so critical. Um, and then these were the kinds of things I asked the mentors, you know, give me some vague sense for each student. Where are they? Did they get up the, like, did they get a built system in a couple of weeks? Um, you know, are they showing progress towards the goal? Did, are, are they basically, are they doing great work? Are they doing good work? Or do they need to work harder? Was the evaluation I'm looking at. And again, I'm, I'm the interface to the university. So the mentors don't have to be qualified or anything like that. I'm just basing their opinions, I'm turning their opinions into grades. So there are no way liable in the system here. So I, I can play fast and loose this way. Um, and I want to be really clear, this is not GSOC. Lots of people said, well, what's different about GSOC kind of thing? It's like, no, we're, this is a single format in a normal semester. So it's not a summer job. Um, I'm working with half the amount of time, I think at that point in the world. Um, mentorship ratio is different. There is a long ramp period for student matching and then for getting the student up and running in the project. And I figure I have max two weeks to actually match the students. And we're trying to do it in the first week and then have them get to kind of mostly it's installed on their laptop somehow. So I, I have almost zero time. Like that is five weeks and five weeks, as I remember vaguely from the GSOC world. Like I'm, I'm down to two, maybe, if I'm lucky. And you know, a key student outcome in GSOC is they get a check. And here, they've paid for the privilege. <laughs> um, and the second time we run this, we actually double the students. We cheated when we did that. We actually brought in the University of Galway. And so this was this interesting overlay of Hopkins didn't know about Galway. So I was merely running a morning class in, uh, and this is all still under Zoom protocols because of the pandemic. So I'm running a morning class in Baltimore that happens to be an afternoon <laughs> class in Galway. It's a common pool of open source projects and mentors. I had administered, again, I have administrative air cover in Galway. I'm not responsible for their marks. There's a real professor for that. So we were able to double this and, and kind of, again, playing with the format, learning from the experiment. Um, and that second time through, I, I'd, I'd started to read. I was going to learn about pedagogy. So let's talk about pedagogy. Um, pedagogy is the art and science of teaching, but something you quickly learn is it's actually the art and science of creating learning outcomes for students. It's not about me at the front of the room, just like right now. It, it's not about me entertaining the students. It's about them actually coming away with some understanding. 
Um, I was lucky going into this. Uh, my wife is a school teacher. She's been 26 years in the English state system as a music specialist, teaching multiple grades at the same time. So like she, she kind of beat the basics into me. You know, every class has outcomes kind of thing. And you know, every, you, that basic form of you know, building a curriculum flow, things like that, having a plan through the whole semester before you step into a classroom. So I did basically have a plan for the semester before I ever stepped into the first class. Yes, I was still building content the night before, but you know, there, was, there was an arc, there was a plan. Um, having learning objectives, if you ever get to do this, is really important when it comes time to building tests because when you first sit down and you're panicked thinking, oh my God, what do I ask them? You can go back to your learning objectives. So it was all good. But you know, the thing I was also going through at that period in history was um, I discovered Jean Lave. Jean Lave is an anthropologist, and she did all of her heavy lifting uh, back in the 70s into the 80s. Um, some of the environments she was studying was tailors, literally you know, sewing clothes, um, in West Africa. And how does that apprenticeship happen? And so there was her work, and then she did work with Wenger, who was one of her grad students, and they looked deeply at five apprenticeship situations. And they come up with this term, legitimate peripheral participation. And it's legitimate, it's a real opportunity for learning. It's peripheral, you are part of the out group, learning your way into the in group. And it's participative, you, you are actually doing something to learn the thing. And this you know, eventually led to Wenger's communities of practice work, but it's all apprenticeship and mentorship. Her fundamental aha for herself was all learning is social learning. Uh, at the same time, I came across Carl Wieman. Carl Wieman, uh, he's a Nobel laureate physicist. He's teaching at Stanford. And he realizes in, with his peers in the late 90s that all of their Stanford physics graduates, as they come into graduate school, don't know how to do physics. And this horrifies them. And so being physicists, they start experiments on the students. <laughs> And they, and they started structuring things, again, around this idea of mentorship. As a Nobel laureate, you know so much more about the subject than these poor undergraduate students that you can't bring your level down to theirs. And so they stepped into this space where, OK, so what do we do with it? Well, you end up giving them reading materials. And then in class, you force them into small teams, three to five, and you give them problems to solve. And you walk them, you know, kind of, you wander the classroom helping them over the homes. Because the, what happens is those students all absorb things at different levels, different understandings, and then they mentor each other into the learning that they are required to solve the problem you've put in front of them. All mentorship and social learning again. And we also have this aha as we come out of this first two iterations at Hopkins. Um, if we're going to scale, OK, so that means infrastructure, organizational capacity to scale projects with mentors and set a bar for mentors. So I can, I've been very careful not to do a Google Summer of Code cattle call, because I can't. I have, I have learning outcomes I'm responsible for that these students are paying for kind of thing. Um, scaling for more schools, well, I'm even just trying it across a couple of schools where I'm the common person in front of a classroom because we cheated with time zones. But again, there's that idea of how do you wrestle with, you know, kind of building capacity in this space. But the mentors come back to me and they've got a concern. The fact that we've got 60 students in two years through this amazes all of us. <laughs> and because you know, they've got four or five other courses banging for their attention. It really is 70, 80 hours is the norm for them to get their work done here. And you know, they're, they're struggling to get it done. They're getting it done. I'm lucky I'm teaching at a university with a fairly aggressive student body, but this, this isn't gonna scale. We, we have a problem here. Now I get lucky. Saeed has moved from Hopkins <laughs> to Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> and we've, we've talked to uh, the head of undergrad studies uh, for software engineering at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And 
he reaches out in the spring of 2023, and they have a problem. Remember, this is that period of history where the industry is swinging the ax. We're losing uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of tech jobs. What that meant for students, though, is a large number of students at CMU had lost their, their internships for that summer. And so Hopkins was going, or sorry, uh, CMU was going to create an internship experience. And so he reached out to me and he said, this sounds kind of like what you were doing. Do you want to co-teach? Now, I love this idea of co-teaching. CMU co-teaches most of their courses, apparently, because it means I now actually get to work with a professional and maybe learn something myself instead of trying to read it all out of books. Um, we set this up, and I reached out to friends in OpenStack who are also in the room today. Um, and uh, there's a couple of Pittsburgh area startups, and his, the, my co-teacher's requirement is that we force the students into teams of three to five because his experience before he came to become a university professor was software engineering is really about communications and learning how to work together. And so that was his requirement on this. The other joy is we have these students, a few of them, we only have them for 20 hours a week, but most of them we have them for 40 hours a week now for a 12-week run. So even with that kind of roughness of that, bring them up the learning curve and the tooling on the front end of it, it's, it's still like we've got a lot more time to play with here. Um, we require two project mentors per, per team of five students. And we do weekly coaching sessions. And when I say weekly coaching, the other prof and I, we are basically having a 15-minute conversation with the student teams. And that 15-minute conversation is often that problem you're having. Reach out to your mentors now. Don't wait for the meeting. Or I know the learning curve's hard. Don't worry about it. You're not being grade on, graded on the amount of code you're writing. And just getting them over that fear. And you know, it's, it's, there was tons of curriculum tuning going on because, again, this is no longer just my ideas. I'm now working with the head of software engineering undergraduate studies who's been building out the program for five years, and he's got ideas too. And I, I'm, again, I'm ecstatic. Um, so there's lots of cur curriculum tuning, and we have the students presenting status regularly. So basically once a month, end of the first month, the second month, and then they you know, real stand up and present what you did with your summer at the, at the end of the, the 12 weeks. Remarkably better outcomes. This is huge compared to the semester course. This, like, and, and yes, of course, like the time involvement from the students and the mentors and all the rest of it, I get it, yes. But it's the student outcomes that are just night and day. Um, you know, it turns out Undergraduates, when you shove them together in teams and give them de decent mentorship, can solve big problems in big software projects. Remember, again, this isn't you know, some toy thing that they got at the university that a couple of professors contrived. No, 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 no. they are working in OpenStack now. Um, the students mentor one another. I really hated this discovery. <laughs> and I hated it. Because a friend at the University of Vermont very excitedly sent me a paper at the beginning of this summer. And it was all about near-peer mentoring in coding boot camps. And my bias against coding boot camps is enormous. So I wanted to hate this paper. And as I'm reading through, and it's all about this near-peer mentorship that happens between the students and the recently graduated students as they're going along, I'm sitting here watching the students do the near-peer mentorship with one another, bringing themselves up amazingly complex tool chains. Uh, to give you a flavor for it, one of, one, of the two, one of the projects they were tackling was they were retooling how you stand up a Kubernetes cluster using OpenStack. And none of these students knew what a container was on the first day. <laughs> So it was a fairly complex, like that, they had eight weeks of learning curve to get to the point where they had a reliable, reproducible testing environment. And they were getting really scared because they're like, there's, there's only six weeks left, there's only five weeks left. There's only... And, and then they, the, they suddenly hit the ground and like all the code just happened. And it was brilliant to watch. Um, so you're living in this space now, they're watching their confidence grow through the three presentations was enormous. 
Listening to it, like it, it, it's very qualitative listening in the weekly coaching sessions, but watching their confidence gain through the actual summer presentations was you know, absolutely consistent. We re-ran, uh, oh, the, the other observation was this idea that unbudgeted work. So remember, these are professional developers working for Red Hat, Microsoft, IBM, working in big open source projects, but they're collaborating together as peers. So they're working on things that actually resolve to their day job and the products these companies ship. So just like every large software project in the world, there's large unbudgeted things sitting below the cut line every year. And this gives them an opportunity to pull some of the stuff that's not urgent but is really important up above that cut line and hand it to a group of five students with you know, kind of some oversight mentorship. And so these are the kinds of projects these students are tackling now. So this, this again, is exciting for the mentors. Not just, hey, I'm a mentor of students and I know that my career is getting better. It's they're allowing them as professionals to pull stuff up from below the cut line and actually get bigger projects done. Um, we reran it this summer at CMU Qatar in Doha. Now, all of a sudden, we, had to, we were forced to change the format a little bit because summer semester is only six weeks, not 12. Because by the time you hit the 1st of July, it's like 50 degrees centigrade in Doha, and everybody just goes. <laughs> if you can leave, you leave. Um, so we worked with the university to extend the course by four weeks, but we cut the students loose so they could all go home to you know, a myriad of countries. We front-ended all of the lessons to four times a week for six weeks instead of twice a week for 12. And the last four weeks, we basically, we, we maintained, they were still hitting their mentor meetings, and they were hit, still hitting their coaching meetings. And the thing was, they built enough trust amongst each other as a team in the first six weeks that they just, like the first few days of all of a sudden working across Zoom was a little uncomfortable for them, and then they just kept working. They, like, so they've also had this real taste of what does it feel like in a modern world to live in a fully distributed environment for four weeks. Um, and they had consistently excellent outcomes. The, the, the one student, they were working on using, uh, there was a little bit of IBM research going on on the side of an Eclipse project to use a, a learning model to then try and triage the bug flow on the front end. And so these students were excited. Hey, it's AI, you know, how exciting can that be? <sighs> They were excited. We didn't say anything. Um, but they, they wrote it up. It's on LinkedIn. And then they, their, their final readout to the class, that 15 minutes, they actually threw the video up on, you, on YouTube. So you can go watch it to give you a sense of what a collection of second and third year students are capable of. Um, and to give you that collection, that, that sense of the diversity of the team as well. So why do I care? What? This is my night job, OK? I work for Microsoft. I have a day job. My manager might be in the audience right now. <laughs> so I have to be very careful how I say these next few slides. The ideas are, are exciting to me. Uh, a guy named Peter Nauer. You know, it's not just the you know, Gene Lave's work. It's not just the near-peer mentorship work. It's not just the obvious overlap with all the collaborative work we do as professionals in open source licensed communities. Peter Nauer wrote a paper back in 85 called Programming as Theorem Building. It's 1985. He's late career. This is the Nauer of Bacchus Nauer formats if you're a compiler person. And the, the, the paper, it's, it's a dense read. But it's a fantastic read. Um, and he, basically, he's taking this, like, why is maintenance so hard? And remember, like, think of coding complexity, even with operating systems and compilers. Those were the big projects that he'd been working on through his career. He's now kind of end of career. It's mid-'80s. Maintenance is hard. And it, you know, it's only going to be a couple more years before Fred Brooks does the No Silver Bullet paper and basically explains, wow, this is still hard, even after you know, we wrote the first book kind of thing. And he basically comes up with this idea that building software is kind of like building a theory. 
The software represents a theory of how the world works, and the developers of that software are the ones that understand the theory. And if you're going to modify the program, you better understand the theory. And so that's kind of his fundamental aha late in career. And the, if he's right, the consequences of this are everywhere. I've been working for 44 years as of last week. The consequences of this are everywhere. And we, we've seen them in different guises, you know, kind of decade on decade on decade, constantly. And you know, that, that idea, <laughs> yeah, we need, we need design documentation, but what we really end up with is the ceasefire line. You know, document your programs, but obviously your documentation's out of date. Um, well, you should document your design then, except your design is always under that, that same stress of dynamic change. Um, we've, you know, literate programs from NUTH, formal methods like Z notation and VDM, and even TLA plus over the last couple of decades. You know, these, we, we keep running into these spaces of these practices that are just hard, and all of them are ways to recapture the theory of the program. And now our fundamental thing is, if you don't understand the theory of the program, every change creates debt. We're all drowning under debt right now, too. Technical debt is killing us. And then you step into this, you know, the, you, if you're basically going to create the unmaintainable ball of mud. Um, if you've never seen the ball of mud paper, it's hysterical. You should read it. It's a little depressing, perhaps, but it's still hysterical. Yeah, it's misery loves company kind of fun. <laughs> now our solution to all of this, though, his, you know, kind of his closing summation is this idea that any new programmer coming into the programming system basically has to be mentored in. That's the only way you're going to be able to pass the theory of this software system to the next generation of people that are maintaining it. And, and here we're not talking generation like old me and young you. We are talking about like just the new programmers coming into the team as the old programmers go on to do other things. You know, the experienced programmers. And, but as, even reading his language in 95, it's all down to legitimate peripheral participation, which Lave wouldn't write for another five years kind of idea as her learnings coming out of a completely different space. So this, this is, you know, it's not just all learning is social learning. Software, to me, the thing that I've been kind of growing my way into for the last five, six years is that understanding that all software is social software as well. And I'm not talking about some altruistic good here. All software, every single piece of software we produce in industry, doesn't matter whether it's IT or vendor, doesn't matter whether it's research or commercial, all software is social software. And you know, I, I talk about this stuff a lot. Um, I walk people into this idea that if you're doing open source community building, you have to walk people in on three on-ramps. There are three on-ramps you must build if you're going to build a community. And when you, you know, I could just as easily, instead of saying, how do you encourage people, encourage people, encourage people, for, you know, that kind of making your project easy to use or allowing a developer to selfishly get to a known experimental state, but and then share the work, I could just as easily be saying, how do you mentor and teach folks into that use of your software, into that known state that they can now go do their own selfish experiments, into that idea that the economics is so much better for them, if they selfishly share their work back to the project and back upstream. Um, you know, and I, and I, again, I often talk about these as skill sets that you need to build around a successful open source community. And it's, you know, there's an engineering skill set around publishing that innovation outbound. There's a community building set of activities when you're trying to capture the innovation back inbound to the project. And then there's a third separate set of skills that you have to understand if you're building the nonprofit. And the only reason you need to build the nonprofit is to remove the risk from the project. And you know, I always dress it up as like this, here's these sets of activities to drive these things, to drive these outcomes. But at the same time, I could really be talking about this right now as mentorship and apprenticeship. You know, the, one of the most successful, fast projects we have seen in our industry over this last little while was the growth of Kubernetes. 
the speed that Kubernetes actually grew compared to how long it took Linux to grow. And that's because there was a particular program manager who stepped in very early in that game in the transition to lay down the architecture of participation and mentor the first cycle of people in, and they mentored the next group of people in. So now that, and we actually had this horrifying moment of realizing why is the governance around the project? So we're, we're not talking about the nonprofit and CNCF at all. We're talking about just the Kubernetes collection of projects. Why is the project rocky right now? And there was that horrifying realization that Gen 2 didn't know to mentor Gen 3 into place. Gen 1 did, they did it naturally. There were, there, there, there were people like me, they stood in there. They knew that they just kind of naturally did it. So Gen 1 to Gen 2 worked. Gen 2 didn't mentor Gen 3 and they just moved on to other things. And Gen 3 is getting a little rocky. So this, this idea of mentorship, even in your communities for how the community behaves, is much more than write down the way you make decisions. It's not about writing down your governance. It's about setting that expectation socially. All software is social software. All learning is social learning. So there's a few things that I'm still playing around with. My boss should close his ears now. <laughs> but you know, there is, I do want to continue the university experiments. Um, I don't have to do that directly. There's enough capacity at Carnegie Mellon that they'll be able to run the experiment without me having anything to do with the classroom this year, but I'll help supply projects into the, the hopper for them kind of thing. Um, software engineering boot camps. Uh, Saeed and I keep talking about how do we try things in non-Western university formats, possibly at CMU Africa. So how do we do something there with either you know, CMU Africa, Codevelop, uh, the Oscar Fest folks, the open source community Africa is another great anchoring group that we can work with there. We've got a number of really large projects that we can play with to get student projects. So things like Moja Loop that does all of the microfinance work in a lot of African countries right now. Uh, we've started discussions with MOSIP, which is a group doing uh, identity software. So there, there's like interesting experiments there. Um, I want to try running this in-house at Microsoft. Microsoft processes 2,000 interns per summer. Um, if, if, if I had kind of 15 groups of five just to try this, the idea that, and I, again, I'm always the guy that talks about open source in a very selfish way. So we have enormous open source projects that we care about. Our, you know, Kubernetes into AKS, all of our own big development projects, things like that. But we also care about the acceptance rate of interns taking job offers. And what we discovered is if you give a student an exciting dynamic environment to learn in, with a certain amount of love and care coming from their management, you can take that from a 30% acceptance rate to an 80% acceptance rate. So now we have an opportunity to start talking again as we process all of these interns. And we can be like, all of us right now, like tomorrow's sauce day, we're all gonna be talking about security. And we all think the universities should do something. Yeah, well, the universities aren't gonna force a class on software by design or security by design. Like they aren't gonna force that on the students. And lots of universities have courses that very few students take but we have an intern population that we pay to be there. <laughs> and we could layer a set of you know, classes across the top of them. And they'll, they'll, they'll thank us <laughs> kind of thing. So you know, there's lots of flexibility in this program. Um, and, and even like there's, there's been some discussion uh, I've had with a couple of colleagues on could we use this to bootstrap new, new hires? Because again, that software engineering theory is being diluted in the industry. So a lot of what it's turning into is tool chain use. And that's good. People need to know how the tool chain works. But there's also that idea that they need to understand the, the why as well. And it, apparently, I've hit my time mark, though I didn't realize I was going to hit my time mark. I thought I was leaving five minutes for questions. Um, but I will happily be out in the hallway after that, after I unmic. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time today.